Okay. And also, I'm sorry, I never asked, how do I pronounce your name? Mari. Mari. Okay. It's a hard one. I think like actually, calamari. I think I did ask you and then I forget Mari. <laughs> no, because I didn't get the I in your name. So I was like, Mari, yes. Mari, Mari. Perfect. It's like the translation, it's Gaelic. So oh, it, cool. like the translation is Mary. Very cool. And my Nona's name is Mary. And, Aww. Yeah. <laughs> and speaking of my Nona, uh, she knows your mother. No way. So right away when you reached out to me, I was like, because the Italian last name, you know, oh, like yeah, I was yeah, like, yeah, yeah. oh, hey, Nona, like, do you know? any for Linos and she was like are you talking to a girl that wrote a book I was like how do you know how do you know this oh my God, so and cute. um yeah so you, um my own and your mom went to adult like learning school together uh, back no in the way. day no and they way. became pretty close Aww. and my own just reflected on her like beauty Aww. and kindness and thought she was a lovely Aww, woman so, so nice. I had to well, tell you. <laughs> thank you my mom will be happy to hear that yeah. that's so cute no, I love it oh, cute. yeah yeah. Like someone said I'm beautiful. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so with that, I'd like to know more about your upbringing in the Sioux and like yes. what does this being from the Sioux mean to you? Mm. So yes, I was born and raised to St. Marie. Um, I was born September 7, mm. <laughs> 1994, like 1030 at nighttime. <laughs> I understood that I have two other siblings. And so I understood that my birth may have been the simplest out of the rest of my siblings. Um, so haha, ha, <laughs> ha, ha siblings. Um, and I grew up, I think the first few years of my life, I understand that we were in a basement apartment. I don't have much recollection of that. Um, but my first memories of childhood would be in my first home, which was actually on West Framer Bay. Um, I actually drove by the house recently, or maybe not recently, but you know, a few months ago. Yeah. And, um, yeah, you know, it's just nice to like reflect. I'm happy that tree in the backyard is still there because, um. <laughs> uh, lots of hammocks, lots of swinging. <laughs> <laughs> um, we used to have our swing sweat in the backyard. That was a very pivotal part of my childhood. Uh, many, I was many times a superhero on that <laughs> swing set and saving the world from all these things and, and rescuing people and, and uh, yeah, so um, yeah, that would be that would be most of my childhood. I was in that home till I was probably ten years old. Okay. I uh, I went to Greenwood Public School in the middle of the cemeteries. Great place for an elementary school. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And I mean that really ju- non judgmentally. Um, just you know, amusing. But no, it was it was a great school. I have a lot of great memories from from Greenwood. I actually still uh, keep in touch a little bit with some of my teachers from elementary school, awesome. and I'll occasionally yeah. see a few here and there. And, and yeah, it's always it's always really nice. It's always really uh, heartwarming. Um, yeah, I have I'm still in touch with a couple of my friends from elementary school as well. Um, you know, I, I mean, obviously life takes everyone in different directions, yeah. but uh, but yeah, you know, I hear from a few of them here and there, and we still keep in touch and catch up when we can. So it's always. So it was really nice. Yeah. Um, but yeah, very, very good memories of childhood in the Sioux. Um, I am, I'm half Mexican, half Italian. So my dad's the Italian side and then my mom's the Mexican side. So a lot of our childhood, we, lots of good food. Yes, <laughs> lots of good food. I can imagine. Being Mexican and Italian. <laughs> um, but, you know, I think that was a very big part of my upbringing as well was the multicultural. And, right. you know, both cultures are similar in some aspects, but different in other ways. And, the year where FIFA World Cup was Mexico versus Italy was an interesting <laughs> year, I have to say, but we survived. <laughs> Everything was fine. The house <laughs> survived. It was still standing by the end of it. Um, but yeah, that was a huge part of my upbringing, I think, was yeah. our being multicultural Definitely. and a really big part of really shaping a lot of who I am, a lot of what I believe in. I think a lot of, as well, the injustice that I see in the world Mm -hmm. um a lot of what we still consistently witness and discrimination and racism you know um I a lot of times I'm kind of considered white facing um but I am someone who because I grew up with these two different cultures I didn't really grow up that particular way you know um so I could see through a lot of that and um I think it's very important to me and I think where I am today like I'm 29, and I when I reflect back on a lot of my upbringing, I kind of see how a lot of those pieces like come together, yeah. and how that impacts a lot of the work that I do now. Yep, that's beautiful. Um, so, as a kid, were you always intrigued with writing? 
and like creative outlets in this sense. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Um, uh, yeah, I was always writing and drawing. I loved drawing as a kid, actually. Yeah. And, and that would have been my creative outlet. I think that if I ever considered myself moving into like taking creativity more seriously, I would have at the time of being a child, it would have made sense for me to have been an artist. Because right. I used to draw all the time. I used to have sketchbooks and <laughs> I used to like, and I had piles, piles of sketchbooks. And I think that was like my form of journaling as a child. Right. Because I don't know, like I have piles and piles of sketchbooks and I was always carrying one around. Um, and then I think as I got older, I went from, you know, instead of sketchbooks, they became journals, <laughs> you know? Right. And then like, I'm not even really sure when that transition took place. Um, but as a child, yeah, highly creative as a child, um, mostly drawing. Um, and then I think I took drawing classes once as a kid mm. with a friend of mine and that was fun. But, um, yeah, I was always, uh, definitely that was a creative outlet for me. I was a very busy child. I was yeah. one of those kids that liked to be busy all the time, liked to learn, um, I was also the bossy child. Mm. I, I could, I had a bossy side. Um, it's very much what I see in my dog right now. And so I don't know. I don't know. I'm not sure what the connection is there, but I'm like, I see you. <laughs> you know? And then I see me and I'm like, Hmm. Um, but I did, I was the oldest of, of three siblings. So yeah, I, I had, I had a bit of a bossy side and, and I like to get things done and make sure yeah. things were done the right way. And, you know, I took a lot of pride in being a responsible child. I think as I got older, I started understanding that yeah, needed to be maybe revisited. <laughs> <laughs> I think it needed to be revisited and maybe softened a little bit. Just a little. That's part of the journey. Definitely. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I would say as a child, definitely lots of drawing. I think I would say that by the time I hit high school, so... Um, yeah, my time in West Bramer Bay was like, I would say kind of true childhood. I moved when I was 10, we moved not too far away. We moved into the Beaumont area. Okay. That was my second home. I was probably 10 years old. And I would say that is probably, I don't know. I don't know what it is about turning 10 and suddenly a lot of that stuff kind of disappeared. Like mm -hmm. I actually did not draw as much in that house. I did not do a lot of like creative things. Um, I, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if there's a shift there from like childhood to preteen or something. But I would say that I don't know. I guess that's when you start getting introduced to other things. Yeah. You know, and not even. I think a lot of people will. You know, boys. It wasn't even that. That that was never something that really interested me. But yeah. it was just. I don't know. You know, suddenly there's that pressure. You know, that you want to fit in. You've got to have friends. You've got to be social. And those things never really interested me. But I think that you know when you're a kid. You feel that you still feel that pressure yeah. right to conform yeah. and yeah. so it's a weird place to be in where you're like eh, that's not really what I want but I still don't know anything else or anything different right so right. you kind of sit in this weird place of what do I do you know how do yeah. I I don't want to conform I don't want those things but I don't know what else to really do also part of that conforming is if you don't conform then you get the judgment so you just sort of teeter in this weird space yeah. of like I'm kind of truthful to this because I know it's what I don't want, but I'm not completely truthful because I can't really have the space to explore what else I could be doing yeah. instead, if that makes sense. Yeah, very much um, so. So yeah, I remember that when I was, that, yeah, when I was 10 years old, moving to that house. Um, and then I went to, so I would have graduated from Greenwood. Then I went to Cora. I was in the ID program there. Um, so yeah, I, you know, went through high school. I would say, I think, I think there are a lot of things about my high school experience that, hmm, like when I revisit, I revisit high school a lot in terms of when I look at my own personal growth. It's like yeah. a very, um, it's, it's, it's a phase of, of life. I think that is one that doesn't really just like disappear. You mm -hmm. know, I think it's, it's, those are your teen years. Again, it's, it's very hard. Um, and it does sometimes be, it can sometimes be hard to be that truthful person yes. in high school. Right. Yeah. And so, and not even just from this idea of a very simplified idea that we see in media about, um, like high school being popular. And, and I think that's, I, I kind of wish we understood a society that that's literally for entertainment. Um, because, I think high school life is way more complicated than that. Yes. You know, it's not just about, I don't think most kids actually worry about being popular. It's like the, there's so much happening physiologically in the yes. body that teenagers can't understand. We don't have the language to communicate. Like 
and I just it just makes things very challenging. Yeah. And so when I you know, in my present moment, when I do my reflections, if I'm meditating and whatever things that ever come up for me that maybe are a little bit more tender or a little bit more, um, you know, even, even like hard, yep. you know what I mean? Um, it, I can usually find a route that will bring me back to a high school period. Yeah. Um, because you know, you're, you're trying to grow, you're trying to figure out who you are. You have that level of awareness of understanding that's what you're doing, but you don't, it's very hard to navigate, right? Cause we yes. don't have the language around that. Yep. Um, we're told a lot about what is success, what you're supposed to be. There's this pressure that at the age of like 16, 17, 18, you can't drive, but like you got to know what you're going to do for your yes. whole future, right? Yeah, like yeah, you yeah. can't vote, but you got to know today what you're going to do for the rest of your life. <laughs> yes. And we put that pressure on teenagers, on kids for that. And, and I don't know if that's really fair because we yeah. are hampering down on that ability to explore creatively. You know, creativity yeah. is not just about arts and all those things it's a huge part of it but like it also is about that space to just explore about yes. curiosity yes. imagination and then when we start putting that pressure on people we don't allow for that space yeah. and then you know I think for myself I mean I ended up getting into life sciences I was in IB but at the end of the day I think a lot of those decisions I made those decisions but I mm -hmm. made those choices because that was what I believed I was supposed to do yeah. right yeah I don't what I wouldn't sit here and say I regret any of it or anything but it's just, it's part of that journey, right? Yeah. It's like understanding that, wow, I'm not sure how truthful that would have been to me at the time. When I look at where I am now, I could have seen myself doing a lot more, maybe like social justice work. I could right. have found myself being way more interested in things like international law, but I didn't know that at the time yeah. because again, we're kind of fed these things about like, well, who you're supposed to be and what you're supposed to be. And so, yeah, high school is definitely, um, I, I really kind of, I spent a lot of time really, I think I would say to myself, I mean, I, I had friends, you know, of course, but uh, I was just, I was always busy because I wasn't interested in a lot of that, like, high school-y, dynamic -y type stuff. I just worked. I worked a lot. Um, I was busy with schoolwork as yeah. well, um, and I played sports. But that was, that was really my high school years. You know, there wasn't a lot of, but a lot of it was just to busy myself because yeah. I didn't want to be involved in a lot of that other type of energy. You know, I, I grew up, I'm, I'm what's called a highly sensitive person. Mm. And so I actually experienced the world very differently from a lot of people. I experienced the world very like viscerally. So like I can walk through a space and like just feel kind of energy and like I can feel it going through the body and it's actually a lot. Yeah. And when you're a child or in high school or just younger in general and you can't comprehend that, it's it's literally physically too much to be in certain spaces. Right. And then you have all these things passing through you and you're like, well, I don't know what this is. Is this is mine? But then it's get confused with the stuff that's yours and it's it's very it's very challenging. Definitely. And so, you know, um, I was like, I'm my way of withdrawing was like to busy myself in certain yeah. areas in which I could um, which I could give me some sense of control, right? Yeah. Which yeah. is not real. You never really have control over anything, right? But like yeah. as a child, as a teenager, as growing up, that was kind of, that was me. That was me. That's what I was trying to do. Yeah. And so obviously I would never have that understanding at the time, but in reflection, I can see that. And yeah. I can see how a lot of those things really, again, shape me and bring me to where I am. Definitely. Today. I resonate with a lot of yeah. that. Um, so I assume that's where you got into meditation kind of from that no, no meditation came for me years later um so high school after high school I would have went to university yeah. I would say meditation came into my life probably I'd say maybe five years ish ago. Okay. I've probably been meditating consistently for about five years um but it took me quite a bit to get to that point of understanding I had to really revisit me mm. um you know I would say the one thing I under like I understood that I was highly sensitive even though I didn't have the language and the words for it yeah. but because of that it's like I had to I had awareness and understanding I had to withdraw from scenarios couldn't understand why but I just had to yeah and so in a weird way though because I always took that that what would be the word I'm looking for I took that initiative right mm -hmm. and in that way that was sort of a prioritization like right. I always took those decisions to prioritize my well-being and again didn't understand it at the time but I did and I think in doing those things that was kind of an act of commitment. And yeah. so, you know, as I continue to do that and continue to become more aware and continue to be committed to that commitment, mm -hmm. um, then eventually by the time that I was consciously making choices and saying, I need to do like spiritual practices, I need meditation, like 
I had already kind of been doing it or leading up to it. I just didn't know it. Right. That makes sense, yep. right? Yeah. Um, but yeah, meditation can come into my life probably till I was like 22. No, probably later. Maybe let's say 24-ish, 24. Okay. Um, but I had done, I kind of kept going with the program, right? I kind of knew at that point what I was supposed to be doing after high school. So I went to U of T. Yeah. I studied life sciences, um, you know, and then again, I was like, I'm going to be a doctor. And, and when I look back, I'm like, I actually probably did not want to be a doctor, but like, <laughs> that's what, you know, you're kind of yes. taught those, like, you those are. are your options, like high school, you know, like, uh, med school, lawyer, blah, blah, blah. And, and then you don't really know what else is out there yeah. and, and, you know, so, or engineering, you know, and, yeah. and. Um, but I just was just, yeah, I gotta follow the program, right? Subscribe mm -hmm. to the program. Um, but you know, then I hit a second year at U of T and I realized I was like, that is not what I wanted. I did not want to go back to school. I did not want to spend another four years in medical school. Yeah. Um, and also I'd always enjoyed working, you know, I enjoyed working. I enjoyed working with people. Um, I enjoyed strategy. And so that was what led me, um, after my undergrad, I went to the university of Waterloo to get my master's of business. And so I thought from there I would get into med tech and like biotech, which I did. Um, and I, you know, that came from a very genuine interest in neuroscience. My mm. specializations at U of T were neuroscience, cell and molecular biology and immunology. So I studied a lot of, um, you know, neurodegenerative diseases, um, how they manifest in the body. And we spoke a lot. I learned a lot about different technologies that were coming to market mm -hmm. and so which are still a lot of them are still like very kind of preclinical stuff today um, but they were very fascinating very fascinating discoveries we learned about the inventions of like mris and how mm -hmm. all that worked and the physics behind it which was a horrible exam <laughs> i will never forget that exam ever um but uh you know it was it was very fascinating it was yeah. very interesting um to learn just the to be able to see and witness the flexibility and the malleability of the human body, mm. especially the human brain, is mm. absolutely fascinating. Um, I don't know. A lot of people we think that the brain is sort the brain is encompassed by the blood brain barrier, um, but they actually at that time that I was studying, there was research showing that that blood brain barrier could actually basically open up and create a gateway to allow certain drugs in if mm. they were um, if they were like accompanied by the proper carriers let's say to, to okay. simplify it um but you know like that stuff's very fascinating and it's stuff that we don't really know about the human yeah. body and so yeah i was like well my because i was someone who works so much for myself i thought well my value add that i could contribute to a space to that particular space would be from a business strategy perspective mm -hmm. so i went to the university of waterloo i was there for a year um did a project around um wound care and using certain sensors to help track I guess you could say the state of chronic wounds so mm. it was like addressing so like diabetic foot ulcers for example okay. right those are chronic wounds um, and so this was a band-aid you could put onto the wounds and it could actually measure like pH um, liquid temperature etc and feed that back to wow. the physician so they could see what was the status of the wound if the dressing needed to be fixed if you know, and then the idea is to prevent things like amputations from happening, uh, to keep that care regular for a lot of the patients that have to live with those sort of, yep. of the, those wounds. So, um, yeah, it was a very cool project and I was very grateful for that experience. I ended up, um, after that, I was the chief operations officer at a gene therapy company. And so that there we had, when you, I don't know if you're familiar with gene therapy, but it's essentially the idea of. If you have some sort of disease, I'm going to go into your body, remove those disease cells or a sample of those cells. We manipulate them on the outside and then we find the error code, let's say, that's creating mm -hmm. that disease. We, it's corrected, let's say, and then we would put that, that we would put a population of, of cells like back in the body basically wow. to heal that, right? Yeah. Um, that's very, very simplified, yes, 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 yes. <laughs> but uh, that's the idea that that's kind of the general idea. And so when you want, but like, you know, you need to have certain, a lot of these cells need cars, you could consider it to get into the body, okay. to get into certain areas of the body, right? Like your heart cells and your muscle cells, all those cells are very different. So they right. have to be, you need a car to bring them in that can recognize the signals. So we had a particular car that just allowed for those cells to be delivered a little bit easier, a little bit quicker. Um, and also was cheaper to produce and um, safer as well, what we were finding. And so my role there was really around manufacturing, really around um, um, 
raising some capital and just kind of overall like partnership strategy and whatnot. Okay. Um, but you know, yeah, like, I mean, I was kind of there doing all these things, but I never really enjoyed it, you know, mm. not to suggest I wasn't grateful for those experiences. Cause I understand, you know, the role that they played in yeah. my journey, but it was never anything that really made me happy. Right. Um, and I think, I don't even think it was anything specific. Cause I was like, I was interested in the stuff I was doing, but I just wasn't happy. And mm-hmm. I think a lot of it has to do with the dynamics of, you know, business mm. of corporations mm-hmm. of, you know, it's just, we're put in these positions where we have to be fighting for things all the time. And right. it's just the most exhausting thing. Dealing with investors can be very exhausting. Mm-hmm. And like, I still deal with investors to this day. So right. I hope they're not upset with me, <laughs> <laughs> but it's true. Like it is, can be very exhausting dealing yeah. with investors. Cause as soon as you work with investors, you're on their schedule, you're on their time. Right. And, and there's this sense of sometimes the sense of righteousness that comes with yeah. that where it's like, but I'm investing in you. So you owe me whatever time I ask for and you owe me all these things. And it's like, well, no, no, I don't. You invested because you believed in me. Yes. So you need to work with me here, not put me in this position where I am like serving you now. That's not right. how it works. Yeah. But it's, it's, it's very hard. And I think being a woman in that space is even more challenging yeah. Yeah. when you have to deal with those dynamics. And, yeah. you know, I think there's a lot of dialogue already around. It is hard to be taken seriously as a woman, 100%. Um, you know, there's a lot more um, judgment calls around you as a woman, um, a lot more... Um, the pressure I think that falls on you as a woman is a little bit different. Um, you know, it's that pressure and expectation to kind of be perfect all the time. Mm. Right. Um, in that space. And if you start, you know, there's less, uh, what's the word like forgiveness. If you make a mistake, it's like remembered right away. But if, if a particularly a white man makes an error, it's like, Oh, it's okay. You know, but with a woman, we're not given that grace. Um, and so I think that all those factors, they're just, they literally, they exhaust you, you know, Definitely. They absolutely exhaust you. And I was very young at that time. I was 23 and I was a chief operations officer. I was being thrust into that world and I didn't have support from a lot of our executive teams. And so, or the other members on the executive team. And then when you try to speak out about it, especially because I was so young, I was mm. being looked at as like, why is she acting so childish? And it's like, right. I'm trying to tell you I need my support right now, but you're not listening to me. Yeah. And so, um, you know, it's very, 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 very frustrating. But um, yeah, I was just sticking with the program, you know? I mm. And then, then, you know, and that's the thing in those positions too, especially being so young, you kind of always think you're the problem, right? Yeah. And as and that's how I always felt moving through a lot of those positions. Like after that, I went to, um, I worked in biotech and I, I was managing biotech portfolio. Same dynamics. But again, you know, you think it's like, well, it's me and I'm here and I'm going to prove myself. And so you're put in these positions to mm-hmm. always prove yeah. yourself, yeah. but you're proving yourself against yourself because it's the system that's yeah. doing this to you, yeah. right? Yep. And so that was a very short-lived experience. And then I ended up leaving that. Uh, I was in corporate innovation for a while after. And uh, I worked in, in telecommunications. So we worked a lot with different startups and health tech and what was it? Like Internet of Things and agriculture, like ag, ag tech. Okay. And so, I, you know, we worked with different startups in those areas. And my job was to bring them in, kind of help them build up the business a little bit, maybe get a bit more traction. And then the idea, you know, would be the organization would typically look for technologies to license or we look for you know ways to build new businesses or add to our portfolios and so one of the really cool projects that I did there which I think was a very defining project for me was um, and I was leading this project was we actually launched an investment platform that allowed employees of our organization to invest in the startups that we worked with wow. so we were yeah we were like the only organization that offered something like that to employees um, and we we started that out, we tried it out with two different startups just to pilot it, and we raised seven hundred and seventy-five thousand dollars in thirty-six hours, between 36 our in thirty-six hours between like just our employees at wow. the at the organization. So it was insane, and you know when we had you had investors of, of all income. You know what I mean? Yeah. It was like it was meant to be for anyone as a retail investor. Right. If you typically want to invest, you have to be a high net worth individual. Mm-hmm. In this case, you didn't have to be. And so we had, you know, individuals from like all different experiences, all different levels. And it was really, uh, I think it was really heartwarming Yeah. to see that. And I think to me, what spoke to me is like, I think there is a shift in society, you know, that why are we comfortable taking risks in startup companies when 
we're consistently told we should be investing in mutual funds and this and that, right? right. And then I think when we looked at a lot of the demographics, we noticed a lot of the, these people investing were younger. Mm. Um, you know, it was like they were younger employees. Um, and I think that carries out, like I'm now more into impact investing. And so we see that same thing. You see a lot more kind of younger investors willing to take that risk and being a lot more socially conscious. Like how right. is my money supported? Yes. Because yeah. You know, if we look at what's happening internationally right now in Israel and Gaza, like, what is our money doing? A lot mm-hmm. of our money is funding that. Um, if you are funding certain funds that are supporting military, like, that's where your money's going. Right. Is that what you want? And I think right. people, I think it's great that people are a lot more aware of that. Like, how can we have a little bit more say over our money? And yeah. I think that that's really important, you yeah. know? So for me at that time when I was in that and I started seeing that, I was like, wow, that's really heartwarming, really encouraging to see that as a society, especially from younger generations, that we're starting to think that way a little more because that will only transpire into future generations yes. even more, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, so I know it's kind of interesting. Like, I mean, I go on all this stuff in tech and you're like, but your book is about meditation. And like, <laughs> you're doing like impact social justice. Like, how does that even make sense? It ties though. <laughs> I, I can see the Thank linear. You. It grows like <laughs> exponentially. <laughs> like it's all Thank you. connected. <laughs> Thank you. It is connected. But like, you know, you don't know until you start doing that exploration. Like yes. that's where the mindfulness comes in. You, know? yep. when you start doing that exploration. Um, you start to see that, but, but we don't because we don't have time for that quote unquote. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So you never actually get to take a seat and look back at your life and, Maybe, and the thing is, like, sometimes, I don't even know if I would say everything connects. Sometimes they don't connect, and I think that's okay, too, yeah, right? Like, yeah. it's, like, literally that is the journey of life, yep. and maybe it doesn't have to connect all the time. Maybe mm-hmm. it's just life happens, and you kind of roll with the punches yep. the best that you can, right? Um, just here to experience it all, yeah. Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. And so, but, yeah, that was a lot of my years in tech. Um, and, again, like, I would say definitely no regrets about it because I think when I, again, looking at where I am today and the work I do now, mm-hmm. I do understand a lot, you know, why I felt a lot of the times the way that I felt about myself, why I felt insecure, why I felt because it wasn't really my insecurities and my fears. These were imposed onto me yeah. by society, by the structure, by economic, by the continued prioritization of ec- economic gains over human mm-hmm. humanity mm-hmm. itself, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And so... Um, but again, didn't know that at the time, but looking back, I can see that and go, oh yeah, like that makes sense. And it makes sense why I would be here today, given the work I've done spiritually to, um, understand those parts of my life. Yeah. 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 It's beautiful that you've given yourself the time that that has led you to that journey to then open up and expand in this beautiful way. So I guess going back to your meditation and journey, like how did you like really like steps to get into that, um, my so my journey was um, very like organic in a way in the sense that um, so I'm just trying to I gotta put my life together. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's a period of my time where um, when I was doing when I was in the telco and corporate innovation, I lived in Calgary at the time, and it would have been probably like maybe a year before COVID happened. And, you know, I mean, all throughout my tech life, so I had all that stuff happening, but I also had a lot of personal things happening in the background. Mm-hmm. Um, my When I was, for example, the chief operations officer in, in, when I was in gene therapy, uh, my father was very sick with brain cancer. Mm-hmm. And so, um, you know, and I was actually doing my master's at the time when he was diagnosed and, um, you know, he was being treated. So we were back and forth to Toronto and, just lots of craziness while trying to finish school and doing all these projects. And then I ended up in that CRO position. Um, so it was, it was very busy, but he had his last wish was he really wanted to go to Mexico. That was kind of his last wish. And, and, you know, he had uh, glioblastoma cancer. So it's, it's, you know, we kind of had an understanding that he was on a, on a time limit at a certain point. Right. And so that was what he wanted. And so we went and I had to leave the organization at that point because it just wasn't really, um, beneficial for them for me to be in Mexico but we did and that's when I started working remotely for that um that that other license managing that biotech portfolio okay and so I was doing that all remotely um but you know that was that was a lot as well you know um and and to be for like to be forced in that position but like forced out of 
you know, like the world kind of puts you in that, like the, like just the circumstances at that time, right? We were in that position. So yeah. maybe I don't mean forced in any sort of negative way, but that's just what happens, right? Life happens and you have to adapt in the best way that you can. And so, um, you know, I felt for myself during that time, that was very challenging. Um, you know, as the oldest, there's always, I always feel for mm. myself and my experience growing up, um, was, you know, there was a little bit more pressure, I think on me to be supportive and not in any way that I would complain about it, but it's just, you know, I think when you're in a circumstance already where it's already like high stress, high tense, that, that feeling is just exemplified, right? Or it's like Definitely. emphasized even more. So it was, it was, it was challenging for those reasons. Um, you know, family dynamics always get really complicated. Um, family dynamics can get very messy in scenarios like that. And mm -hmm. so, uh, there was a lot, it was just, it was a lot for me. It was a lot for me to really, um, it was just a lot really yeah. honestly it was just a lot I yeah. think yeah. that's the only sentiment I can share <laughs> is that it was genuinely a lot um I also had a very personal experience so I I right now do a lot of work in you know gender-based violence that's a very important cause for me I was sexually assaulted when I was 23 around the time that my dad was uh, also sick and mm -hmm. so you know like really like around the time that my father passed away it was a lot like I was right. pretty wiped out um you know when you face things like like sexual assault, you know, your whole, your whole, everything's being taken from you, right? Because you have someone who's like violating you and your space and your rights, your voice for their own gain. And so it's, it's very messy walking out yeah. of a situation like that. If you can come out walking, because mm. a lot of women don't, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of women do not. Gender-based violence is very real. There are many women who die. Um, but, and then even those who do end up leaving, it's very challenging because yep. there's not a lot of support in the system yep. for women who experience this. Yep. And so, you know, for whatever reason, just the circumstances of my life, I was able to get out of my situation, but I mean, I was still like, there was, you know, like I was raped and it's, it's hard. It's a lot, it's a yep. lot on you. Um, and it's a lot when you don't have support yep. and you don't know where to go. I think that, you know, all the, you know, well, you have education, you have all these things and all these things were good, but it didn't help me from things like psychological abuse, mm -hmm. from things like emotional abuse mm -hmm. and from a lot of the shaming that comes from when you try to speak up about it, people don't want to hear it. You know, it's like, it's like, it's such a, you know, even amongst people that were close to me at the time, it was like, people just like, it's like people get scared. So they yeah. just don't want to hear it. Yeah it's like you're disrupting their life and <laughs> you're like um okay yes, yes. so sorry no, no. <laughs> yeah, like so sorry to be disrupting your life right now you know um and and then and then people end up blaming you for it you know and it's like well why'd you do that well i don't think you understand <laughs> what the psychological nuances are behind this where yeah. you don't have a choice yeah. and if you don't do that you're in danger or you're threatened yeah. um and the reality is like you can, I was saying no, and that was not being honored, right? So right. it's a huge violation, not just like physically of the body, but like emotionally, mentally, psychologically. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a lot is taken from you. And so to, you know, so, you know, as a student being that young, holding these executive position, dealing with a father who was sick, yeah. um, plus additional pressure of in just that whole family circumstances, then you still have that that you're carrying with you. like. What do you do? I was 23. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, yeah. what do you do? I was 23. And so after my father passed away, I really like disappeared. I was like, I need my space. Mm -hmm. I need to hear me. Mm -hmm. I need to understand how can I have all these, how can I be checking all these dots, but still be in scenarios where I am feeling like this, yep. where I'm being exploited, manipulated, et cetera, et cetera. How do these, these things don't make sense. Yep. Right. So like I needed absolute silence. And so I went to Calgary actually to visit a friend of mine. And I stayed there for a few weeks and then I was like, you know what? I didn't have a job. I didn't have anything. I had some savings. So I was like, I'm just, I never went, like, I just stayed. I just stayed. I found an apartment. I stayed there for a couple of years. Um, and so when I was there, that's when I started, you know, at a certain point I had to get back to work. So I went back into corporate. That's when I started corporate innovation. Um, but then, then just around the time COVID was happening, um, I had taken an interest. I started taking an interest again back in kind of like arts and, and especially media. And so I was being drawn to acting school. And mm. so there was a school in California. I would known one of the, one of the coaches from the school. She lived in Calgary at the time. And so she uh, reached out to me and was like, Hey, we're running some virtual classes if you want to start. And so 
that was actually my introduction to mindfulness. Wow. Um, the school that I went to used a lot of mindfulness principles to help students or actors like find your characters because wow. it's very beautiful. Like, and the, the, art, the art of acting itself, and I'm not talking about celebrities, I'm talking about the art of acting mm-hmm. is actually very beautiful. And it really is this idea of like, how do you embody another character, but through you, right? right. You are the vessel. Right. And so how do you, how do you access yourself and your life and your experiences and become somebody else? You mm. know what I mean? And so, but you're still kind of yourself at the same time. So it's like, it's a very unique exploration and that is where mindfulness was used. And we used lots of uh, visualization techniques mm. for that, meditation itself for that. Um, journaling was huge. And that was probably where formally journaling started taking a huge impact in my life. My particular coach said something that I kind of still share with a lot of people to this day, where um, if you when I was getting started in this practice, the way to get started was even before meditation or anything was just journaling. And so my mm-hmm. practice began with every morning when you wake up, just write, right? Whatever comes to mind, doesn't matter what it is, can be anything you want, literally can be sentences, bullet points, doesn't even have to be complete, just write, just literally write, write, write. And whenever you're done writing at the end of this practice, you will always write a fears list and a gratitude list. Mm-hmm. And the purpose for that is because it's interesting to see one, how your fears don't always align with what you write. Mm -hmm. And secondly, your gratitude list will always be longer than your fears list because there is always more to be grateful for than there is to be afraid of. And you know, those words were very, very important to me at that time. And I think they're words that I always offer to people because it was just such a strong message. And so I did that. That's where journaling started for me. And I kept, kept, kept it up and then you know through acting school there was again the meditation the mindfulness and yeah they were it was kind of the first time in my life where I felt I guess heard but in a way that like I could hear myself right if that makes sense and so especially being somebody who you know was highly sensitive mindfulness was something that really did help me really validate a lot of how I always, I had this level of discernment always because I mentioned earlier, I always had to kind of remove myself from certain scenarios because I understood there's this like conflict within right now that I can't identify, but I can feel it in the body. And so I have to remove myself. And so that's discernment and understanding that now from a mindfulness perspective made a lot of sense to me. And I was like, oh, I get it. I understand why I can understand mindfulness, why I can embrace mindfulness, spirituality Mm -hmm. in such a way because in a way I already kind of had been. I right. just didn't know it because right. of all the stuff happening. Around yeah. Um, I guess maybe going into why you started teaching, adding that into your credentials of meditation, mm. was that through like more expanding your own personal meditation practice or the intention to teach and expand other people's meditation yeah. world? At the time, so that came probably a few years later, even after, because I just did that, I think, a year ago. But that was definitely more for my own personal practice. Yeah. Um, I, I think, you know, meditation is about holding space, you yeah. know, and, and, and that in itself is an act of solidarity, an act of, of just presence. It's just holding space. Yeah. And what I had learned continuing to navigate into impact, social impact, social justice, um, we always think that we have to act, we have to do something. Mm-hmm. And, but literally you don't. Sometimes it's enough to just hold space. Sometimes it's enough to just be present. And that is the practice of of mindfulness. Um, So my practice of mindfulness is is rooted in Buddhism. And Mm -hmm. Buddhism is that, is is presence, is awareness, is openness, is acceptance, is about love, unconditional love, but not the kind that we see in society or like in media. It's like the truth of love, that the love you have for yourself is the love you have for those around you, is the love you have for strangers. It's, It's just literally... To Buddha, there's nothing else but love, basically, (laughs) like in this very simplest form, right? And so, um, but that was why I went back to get that certification was because, you know, after after doing the acting school, um, I was in Calgary at the time, and then I, my sister had gone to a car accident, actually, and um, that was right when COVID was, that was right around COVID was opening up, or no, sorry, was starting. And so, because she was in the hospital, and no one was allowed to see her. Mm, she was in a coma right. for about 10 days. But, you know, imagine, like, waking up after an accident like that and, you you know, you're not allowed to see your family. Yeah. You're not allowed to. Like, that's a lot, right? And so 
I ended up moving back home after that. And, um, or I, well, I moved to Toronto. Um, so I moved back to Ontario, so I was closer. Um, but yeah, there was, there was just a lot of, like I was back, I would have been back in Toronto. I would have been back there for a couple of years. And then I was in California last year. And that was when I started doing the mindfulness, uh, teachers certification. And that was because at that point it had been a couple of years of practice. Yeah. And so, you know, I kept up with the journaling. I'd kept up with the meditation on my own. You know, I wrote human, which I'm sure we'll get into. Yes. And it kind of came out of a lot of my journaling, but you know, it was like at that point I was practicing, practicing, practicing. Um, and I, and it was great because I was doing it in a way that was intuitive to me and mm-hmm. that I was able to explore kind of myself and what worked for me. But then I started missing the kind of cultural aspects of it, the, the truthful spiritual aspects of it. And so that was why I was like, well, I'm going to go do this, this certification, but really more for me to just learn more about yeah. where all these things that I'm practicing, where did they come from? How did it come to be? What is the story of Buddha? Yeah. Um, you know, so that was why I went back and did that, did that certification. And then as a result, you know, yeah, it was great to be able to actually show up and hold space in a way that's meaningful. In my particular, I went through the lab of meditation, which is recognized by the International Mindfulness Teachers Association and is actually founded by Hiro, uh, Hiro Dimekulis. And so Hiro um, is actually from Italy. She lives in Vancouver now. Mm. And they actually are a consultant for the United Nations Peace on Purpose wow. project. So, and, and, and they've been coached uh, by multiple different, very well-known uh, spiritual leaders. And so it was a really great practice. And I always, I always recommend people interested in that, in mindfulness and learning more to check out those yeah. programs because, you know, um, yeah, it's really great. It's very open and, and heroes are very, very authentic and very compassionate leader and hold space in a very truthful, very soft way, but in a way that is, is grounded. Mm. You know what I mean? Mm. Yeah. I think that we see a lot, you know, I don't think we realize that softness can be grounded you know Mm. sometimes we mistake softness for fluffiness and they're very different you know fluffiness is is ungrounded and so softness in a grounded manner is actually very beautiful and I think that's a very important message for women or anyone who identifies as a woman because yeah we're not really taught that we're taught to either fear or shame our softness and then on top of that fear and shame any quote-unquote like hardness or (laughs) you know what I mean like there's no there's there's no no middle ground but I think that it's important for Everybody, I guess I would say, to know yeah. that, you know, groundedness, being grounded in your softness, being grounded in your boldness, being grounded in your hardness is okay and acceptable. And yeah, and then I'm, that was one of the things I learned a lot from Hero. Yeah. And just that's a lot of that just comes from being in their presence, you know? Right. Um, they'll, you'll get the learnings, of course, and you'll learn the stories, you'll learn about Buddhism, you'll learn about dukkha, you'll learn about suffering, you'll learn about all those things. But at the end of the day, when you're present and you're part of, you get to be part of holding that space, right? right? It's a very different experience. Yeah. And so um, anyone who's interested, I highly, highly recommend exploring Hero and, and just learning from them completely yeah. because it's really beautiful. Um, but, uh, but yeah, that was long answer to your question. No, that, that was is, beautiful. That I love, why. I love, I love how you uh, you say everything so beautifully. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> so let's dive into human then. Sure. Um, I guess let's start with a quick synopsis of the book. I read the book. I think it was beautiful. Uh, oh, I, I loved it. Um, yeah, maybe start with a quick synopsis of sure. it, and then we'll go dive deeper into how it came about. It's funny. I mean, human. So human. I wrote it almost what three, four years ago now, and so it's kind of funny because if you asked me at the time what I thought my book was about versus asking me mm. now what my book is about, it kind of changed a little bit. Like at the time, you know, it came out of journaling, it came out yeah. of the journaling practices, and this for me it was a particular realization that I was having as I continued to just sort of navigate my own trauma and understand it and understand how it just took up space in the body you know Mm. what I mean um but then so as you know I started releasing a lot of it and it takes time it's not something that happens in a day and I don't even think I could suggest that I'm still not releasing any trauma right like that's I think very unrealistic but I think it's more about coming to peace with trauma right like understanding 
this is just kind of part of the journey and it's going to take up space in the body and when it comes up I can just acknowledge it as that as this is just something coming up coming back to the breath Mm -hmm. and just maybe moving away from it or or just allowing it to pass let's say maybe not moving away from it but allowing for it to just be there and honoring it because that is part of your life Mm -hmm. right and Mm -hmm. if you you don't want to dishonor parts of your life you don't want to disrespect parts of your life it's part of the journey and we look at life that way as the journey you know it just takes that pressure off and so but at that time what was happening as I was going through some of those realizations I was starting to especially for me would have been abandonment would have been a big one which I think comes from you know probably some family dynamics of course I think that's very common to a lot of people Mm -hmm. Um, I think abandonment is a lot more common in society than we realize Mm -hmm. because it's just kind of disguised as all these other things but if you were to address a lot of the root of your fears and insecurities abandonment is probably going to be one of them yeah. not good enoughness is going to be another one like those are and they're all like very very common amongst everybody yeah. and we just don't realize it because they hide in every other story that we're told and our ego our ego hey our ego <laughs> likes to protect us i appreciate that but there are moments when your ego when you're in a conflict and you know that part of you's like well you don't deserve to be yes. spoken to that way that is the ego <laughs> and you need to tell your ego like thank you for caring <laughs> but that's enough <laughs> like I have learned my ego is like a five-year-old having a tantrum. Like, yeah. well, me, 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 me. I'm like, are you done right now? Ego, are you done right now? Yes. Like, can we just come back? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but know? I resonate. <laughs> so, um, but at that time, for me, it was really sorting through abandonment. And I think there's some realizations coming up around how we all experience a lot of the same things and a lot of the same feelings just in a different context, right? You and I could experience abandonment, but based off of very different things that have happened to us in our lives. And I think what's interesting though, is that in society, we actually ignore that. Mm. So we we all kind of come from the same place. We all experience the same things, but then when you, you, no one talks about it. You know, we kind of like, we're like, we just pretend it doesn't happen. And then we get so involved in our own world and what's happening that we don't realize the same thing's probably happening to the person beside us or in front of us. Yep. And so at the time I thought it was about ignorance. That's what I thought I was writing mm-hmm. about was like our ignorance to that yep. and how these things that we're ignoring are actually the things that connect us. Right. And so that's, that's where human came from. And so it came from a lot of, um, a lot of it came from directly my journals. Those experiences that are written about were like from my direct experiences, direct observations um, direct questioning and, mm-hmm. and how is it that we can all experience the same things? How can we move through each other's lives and literally not know, mm. you know, that we are so connected, but we just, we don't know. And we are taught not to know, right? Yeah. Like we are conditioned to believe we are separate, but we're not. Right. We all, the human experience is the same for every single one of us, just in a different context. Yep. And we don't realize that. And so I think that is at the time, human, when I wrote it, was about human ignorance, quote unquote human ignorance. But now I can like maybe succinctly say it a little differently and that it's about that, the fact that this is what connects us. Right. And we should be more aware of that because that is kind of the heart of social justice, of communities, of just that acknowledgement that the separation we're taught is just, you know, spirituality is an illusion. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? It's all an mm-hmm. illusion. Mm-hmm. Um, but like, how can we actually come together despite these differences we are shown right does, does that make sense yeah um, and so that to me is what human is to me um, and then how can we be more human to ourselves to each other and to the rest of the world yeah because it comes with us i cannot have the capacity to connect with people and understand their trauma and where they come from without understanding my own it's just mm-hmm. not possible yeah. right it's straight up not possible because I cannot see other people's trauma until I see my own. And so it starts with you. It starts with each of us individually to go inward and to explore who am I, but not even in a philosophical, you know, and at the end of the day, what is, who am I? Who am I is an essence, you know, Mm -hmm. is, is what is the essence of me, you know, and where does that come from and how can I connect with this essence of me in this current conditioned world? Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And how can I be grounded in that version? How can I be grounded in that essence? Yeah with everything happening around me, whether it's, there's the societal structures, also the human suffering, right? Like human suffering is kind of inevitable. And what Buddha tells us is that suffering, we create our own suffering, but it's also that we create, we also, we create more of the circumstances around our suffering, right? Because of things like attachment, because of our own just kind of ignorance, because of our inability to be compassionate to ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so 
you know, um, yeah, that to me is like, that's where human came from. Human came from a lot of those different pieces coming together and saying, well, if we're human to ourselves, if I can show this compassion to myself, I can actually be human to other people because I'm opening up space. I'm creating space within for my honoring of my human experience. So now I have that space to honor someone else's human experience. And then that actually just perpetuates to the rest of the world, yep. to global issues. People don't realize that Buddhism is a lot more about social justice than mm -hmm. anything else. Mm -hmm. In secular mindfulness, in Western mindfulness especially, a lot of mindfulness is actually portrayed unintentionally as escapism. Mm -hmm. You know, mindfulness is not, oh my God, I'm stressed, I'm coming back to the body and I'm just ignoring everything else right. around me. That's not mindfulness. Yes, come back to the body. Yes, come back to the breath. Absolutely. But at the end of the day, the truth of mindfulness, the truth of Buddhism is that opening up, yeah. right? It's that, okay, I'm coming back. I'm coming back to the present moment. And in the present moment, there is still suffering within and there's suffering around me. Mm -hmm. How can I hold space mm -hmm. for all of this yeah. in a way that's open so I'm not closed off, so I'm not trying to ignore the realities of the world? Because if we didn't ignore the realities of the world, we could have a very different way of living, right? Yes. So Beautifully, beautifully <laughs> said. <laughs> So why did you choose this format? Because it's not like you could have written that in more of like a self-help book format, but why did you choose to write it in the more of a narrative story following like your thoughts as you're going through and starting to take action in those ways? Um, because I wanted it to be that authentic journey of what, of what inner exploration looks like. Yeah. Right. I think a lot of self-help, you know, sure. You, like it's not, it's just, it's, it's, Lots of people try to give you the tips or they want to tell you the journey, but they don't tell you this is what, this is the inner dialogue at points of my life like this, right? And we don't, and, and I don't, I'm sad that we don't share that the, yeah. in that way more often, right? Because we, it just, it accidentally encourages people when we don't share that authentically, it encourages people to rush to the ending, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Let's just mm -hmm. rush to where we want to be. Let's rush to the destination, but yeah. that's not real. There's yeah. really no destination. The only maybe destination in life is death. <laughs> like at the end yeah. of the day, that's kind of where you're only really going. And like, and even Buddhism, like Buddha has that acknowledgement. If you go through a lot of those early scriptures, that is, it is like literally accepting death. Right. Like death is going to happen. But like how, and it's being grounded in that. It's that realization that, so this is life. It is because of death that you have life. Mm. And so how can we move through life in a way where we're not just rushing to the end? Yeah. Let's just like be present, enjoy life. Be aware of the beauties of life. You know, when you wake up, the sun is out, even if it's raining. Like, there is so much beauty mm -hmm. in every single moment. Um, this table, why not? Like, literally, yeah. like, there are molecules that we cannot see that come together to create this desk. Yeah. Like, I mean, how is that not beautiful, yes. right? Like, there is so much beauty everywhere. And so, um, but that was why I went for the more narrative nonfiction approach was because yeah. I really wanted it to be a very intentional, hey, we see what, what this exploration could look like at the end game right quote unquote end game but we mm -hmm. don't see we don't hear this is what it sounds like this is what it feels like you know yeah. that you can still see things around you be triggered by them and still be grounded in what's going on around you does that make sense yes definitely. Um, and so that was why I chose that approach because I was like yeah. I want people I want people to hear that and I want people because I think again we all have the same human experience. We yeah. all are experiencing that, but we don't talk about it. And mm -hmm. so then we're sort of left in this space of like, well, I'm the only one who sees the world this way. Yes. And I had a very unhealthy thought about, I used to think that about myself for a very long time. And it's very unhealthy yeah. um, because part of it is like trying to comfort yourself. But the other part of it is actually kind of degrading yourself. Right. And so yeah. um, how, again, like um, it was really about giving that perspective and saying, you know, everybody, you are probably thinking like this too. So you are not the only one. Right. Yes. And so those were the two biggest reasons that I wrote the book in that way. Yes. Yeah. I love it so much. Um, so you got your book. It was in New York Times Square. Yeah. It was featured in there. <laughs> yes. So how did that opportunity present itself? How did to that you? happen? So that came up through um, an award that the, the humans won two awards, I think. Um, and one of the awards that it won. Uh, it was just part of that feature. And yeah, it was in Times Square. That was a very exciting, uh, yeah, that was exciting. Yeah. That was very, uh, yeah, just exciting. You know, I, I don't know. I, I'm, I, I never do things for necessarily for that sort of recognition, right. but it is exciting, I guess, you know, definitely. to just have that opportunity. And, and yeah, I, I'm yeah definitely grateful. Um, and I think grateful because of what I believe I wrote about human, right? Why I yeah. wrote it. And so 
um, if there's an opportunity to get that message out. Yeah. I know this is not just about a book, it's the message of the book. For um, sure. You know, then I hope that that's also taken into account in terms of like a feature in Times Square. But yeah. yes, it was. That was about a year ago, I think, yeah. in January. Yeah. That's so awesome. Um, being an author, did you imagine that to happen? Like, what was like. I'm assuming there was like probably some guidance or some intuition that knew that you needed to write a book. You know what I mean? Like, oh. how did you like, you know what I mean? How does a book just come out of thin air? Yeah, it came, it came from journaling. Yeah. Um, and like I said, you know, those realizations of, um, you know, how I was seeing the world, how I think other people saw the world, how we move through the world, um, you know, and it was really just revisiting a lot of those journal entries and, right. and it, yeah, it didn't take too long to come together. There was probably one or two early drafts if I remember correctly. Um, but even then, like a lot of those really early ones were just trying to like figure it out, like trying mm -hmm. to, it was more about like the boundaries of what I'm trying to say, right? right. There's so much that you could say, but it was like, how do you, how do you say succinctly without, and, and also I wanted the book to be less than hundred pages. Yeah. I wanted it to be a very short book. And so there was a lot of just having to take out things that just didn't fit more because there has to be a balance, I think, between here's the experiences, here's the emotions, the emotional side to it. Yeah. And then here's the realizations of it. Right. right. And so there were times where writing can be very cathartic and that's very normal. Mm -hmm. But, you know, when you're writing a book, you don't want to be writing just a complete catharsis, right? Like right. that's not, um, what's the message that you're trying to get across? You yeah. know what I mean? And so that's where intentionality comes in. And so a lot of what I had ended up removing would have just been more of the things that were just more cathartic than anything mm -hmm. else that was kind of, and again, and at the end of the day, you know, that, that just comes from me personally is like, I just wanted to be heard and validated. Yeah. So when I could understand, well, I'm just putting these in because I want to be heard and validated. That's very human of me and totally normal, but I can honor those things in my space without needing to disrupt the intentionality of this writing. Right. Does that make right. sense? And so, um, yeah, it, it, I wouldn't say definitely would not just like magically come out of thin air. Yeah. Um, but I wouldn't say it wasn't planned either. It was like, right. we're writing and we're writing and then you just, the quote unquote revising is really just kind of removing the stuff that nice. distracts from the intention. And so that was my process nice. I would say in writing. Um, so let's move on to, you have a foundation as well. Um, being human mm -hmm. foundation. So when did that start? Did that start through the book process? That, I would say, um, and so yeah, the foundation, I also have the show and I'm going to clump those in together yeah, just okay. because they both came from the, the ideas that come out of the book. Yep. You know, this idea of that extension of be human to yourself, each other, then the world, right? That's kind of where, you know, if we talk about being human to the world, like that's where the Be Human Foundation really fits in. You know, yeah. how do we take these mindfulness principles? How do we take things like arts and culture, which are very important because not just from a therapeutic level, not just from a creative outlet, but when we talk about society we talk about you know discrimination all those things it's because i personally believe you know we don't sell we don't take the time to celebrate and honor other cultures um, we don't take the time to learn to understand them instead we sit in this space of like judgment and because you're different from me blah 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 i don't care etc which is horrible yeah. um, and so you know that's where the being human foundation came from was like yeah. how can we take these principles of being human to ourselves how can we connect with each other and then how can we create good in our world, in our communities especially? Um, I think that to do good in the world, you know, the world is so large, it has to start in your community. And I think if every single one of us made conscious, intentional efforts to participate in our communities, whether that's donating, volunteering time, whether that's literally, you know, on Truth and Reconciliation Day, do you just show up and hold space at the vigils? That's enough. No. You know, that is participation in your community. That is supporting your community. And that is an intentional effort to be part of the entire community, to be part of an inclusive community, right? right? And so that's where the Being Human Foundation really came from. Um, the Human Challenge, same idea. It's a bit of an extension of that where let's talk about a lot of these different perspectives. How can we challenge ourselves to be more human in today's world? 
Um, how can we challenge each other to be more human? Um, what are the challenges in being human? And how can we create that difference for the greater good? And so I, I actually love my show because I talk to so many amazing people who bring in these different perspectives, who talk about very important things, climate change, accessibility issues. I just released an episode with four women who have all had major, uh, well, I believe three of them had major accidents, which led them to you know amputations, wheelchair. And so realizing the system actually doesn't work for me and have made that change for themselves. And they're like very, very phenomenal women. One of those women, so she was the one who was not injured, um, who did not go through a personal accident, but spent time in the accessibility space. Mm. And so she's actually developing a fitness app for individuals who have dis physical disabilities mm. so that there is inclusive um, fitness. And, and it's a crazy that we don't think those things, you know yeah, what I mean? Like, like yeah. in, in, in a weird way, it almost makes me sad to realize, wow, that's so brilliant. And it's kind of sad that it's so brilliant, right? right. Because how can we have been so ignorant to our disabled communities yeah. when that's such a large part of the, the population? And so, um, yeah, I, I love my show and the people I get to meet and the mm -hmm. people that I get to, the stories and how they use their own journey of being human, right? That I think challenge all, challenges all of us to take that same journey to then do good in the world. Yeah. And so um, yeah. all of those came out from the principles of, of human, you know, right. extending this idea of hum being human and how do we be human to ourselves, to each other in the world. Yeah, it's beautiful how like broad your subject matter is, but like you can have such intricate niche mm. conversations and go so deep into that world of being human. And Absolutely. you connect with a lot of people from the Sioux as well. You bring it back. Yeah. You got Roberta yeah, yeah. Bondar. Yes. yes. <laughs> I have Roberta Bondar. Oh my gosh. I was like, oh, did you listen to that conversation? It was I so good. Yeah. Roberta Bondar is just magic. She, Honestly, uh, like she fun. just like, we were talking about space, but we were talking about life. Right. And I was like, Roberta Bondar, like, who are you? Like, the <laughs> wisdom of this woman. It was yes. so great. It, that was a wonderful conversation. I, I don't know if you could tell. I had to try really hard not to fangirl. Like, <laughs> I, in the beginning, I could hear my voice. I was like, oh, my God, like, it's Roberta Bondar. I could, like, hear my voice, like, getting higher. And I was like, yeah. Vanessa, come back, come back, come yeah. back. <laughs> but, like, yeah, that was cool. Also had Ava Nori. She yes. just released her book uh, not too long ago. And I actually went to her launch. And so, yeah, that, I think I really liked her conversation, our conversation as well, because, um, you know, she, I think for her to be talking about things like, um, like very like adult subject matter at such a young age, yeah. um, you know, I think is important because it just goes to show you that like our younger generations one are impacted by a lot of those things. Um, and that it's a lot more, I guess, widespread, if that's the right yeah. word, than maybe I even realized. Cause when I went through her book, I was like, wow, like she's talking about a lot of very like deep things. Mm -hmm. Um, and I mean, yeah, I don't know, but also like, I mean, I was actually going through similar experiences, I think, where we were, I would say like when I was her age, I was also viewing the world in a similar manner, which is I think why a lot of her work resonated with me. Yeah. Um, and that's not to detract from her success in any way, shape or form. Um, you know, I say that just very humbly, but I think that was why one, I connected with her on that level. But I think it's like at the same time, it was like to be able to have the acknowledgement, but to also feel like, wow, our young kids really are exposed to a lot. Mm -hmm. That observation in itself kind of was like an interesting contradiction to me, right? To be like right. how I, at that time I was having similar observations to her of the world, but now looking back, it was almost like looking back on myself in a way. And it was like mm -hmm. a weird way of even being able to be compassionate to myself. And I want to use that example because that is also part of being human to yourself yeah. right how as human beings our connections with people they are opportunities for us to heal individually and collectively yes. right and yeah. so I think that's a very big part of the human experience journey that uh, I wish we just were a lot more aware of yeah. because again healing literally happens you and I having this conversation we will both probably walk away from something and be like definitely. wow there's a part of me that healed or is heard or validated or whatever right definitely and so that's why I wanted to offer that but yeah mm -hmm. I do my best to bring it back to the sea yeah I love that that's beautiful yes. Also had Brian Brian from To Go in the Press. Oh uh, yeah, I don't know yeah, if you yeah, saw yeah, that yeah. episode. That came. That one was about. Uh, I met him a few times. That was about uh, global. That was like the green, going like uh, well, climate change. That was that okay. was that episode. That was a good one too, actually. And we spoke to a professor at Brock University who studies uh, the Anthropocene era and how like our as a society because we've become so consumption based, we have actually rushed the age of the, of the, of the world essentially. Mm. So we're like, yeah. we basically create an entire new era because of our consumption. Yeah. So yeah, that was a really interesting. That's so interesting. Well. Mm -hmm. So how do you like, uh, scout these people and like, um, seek I, them out, I guess just, that's a great question. I don't know. Sometimes I hear things. Sometimes people will send me things. Hey, check this out. Did you see this? 
Um, okay. Actually, the human challenge was just um, Amazon Music and Acast Indie Podcast yeah. Amplifier. Yeah, on Amazon Music. So that got a lot of good. That's when I had like Miranda Ayim. I don't know if you saw that episode. She's an uh, Olympian on Team Canada three times. Three-time Canadian Olympic Olympian on Team Canada for basketball. There we go. Um, yeah, so she was on the show. And, yeah, I got some very solid... You know, that that brought in a lot of very interesting guests. Yeah. I interviewed a couple of weeks ago, and I think I'm going to release it probably in February as a special episode. It was 90 minutes, this episode, but it was so good. <laughs> and it was this singer in Berlin, and she is wow. actually like... Yeah, I know. Like, And that one actually was a recommendation to me from somebody that I knew. But her story is fascinating, especially when we talk about like things like gender-based violence. Like yeah. She... So her grandfather was born in Yemen, walked the desert, entered Palestine, but like she grew up in Israel, had to go into the army, but she worked in the army and entertainment, did you know, gender-based violence stories. And then like, yeah, and she's a sing. Anyways, like this wow. story is absolutely insane, but she didn't even know that about her background until the recent events that have happened since October 7th. So like, honestly, like my brain was just, I could not stop talking to her. Like wow. I was like, you need to tell me everything about your life right now. <laughs> But it was phenomenal. And, and yeah, like, I, I don't know. Sometimes I find these people. Sometimes these people find me. Right. Sometimes it's connections. It's really just, I think, just being open-hearted yeah. and open-minded to the stories that come across, yep. you know, yep. that we come across. And I think they're very important. But, yeah, yeah it's, um, yeah, yeah. So that episode's coming out. And I have a few more. Um, yeah, and I do my best to talk about everything, you know, because yes. anything that's really related to, like you said, the human challenge, the human experience, it's so broad that you can really have so many different conversations about it, so, so many different many. perspectives. I think it's really beautiful. Yeah. I'm th- like, I, I like coming out of my episodes here at the museum with that little bit of element of that human experience. Yeah. Um, because I like to, obviously it's based around Sioux history and Sioux mm. people. So encouraging more of that community here because we are isolated. We are like North. We have like a different reputation. So I like to capture that, that, the element of human experience by coming from yeah. us mm. is so unique, I think. Um, you are who you are because you are from mm-hmm. this northern community. So I think that's pretty pretty special. Um, <laughs> um, so what's next in your journey and what are you working towards? Because I know there's the project 8 Billion Voices. Yes, yes. <laughs> I'm so excited about 8 Billion Voices. So we're actually doing a song launch next week. Um, you know, the idea behind, behind 8 Billion Voices is really around advocacy for um, um, gender-based violence. Um, you know, one in three women, this is according to the United Nations, one in three women are impacted by some sort of, um, whether it's like from your spouse or non-spousal, but mm-hmm. it's gender-based violence. And um, and actually, I would think that that stat is probably even outdated. I'm sure it's, it's more. Um, I was chatting with a, I teach, actually, if you want a suit connection, I also teach spin class at Rampant. Yeah. <laughs> if anybody wants to check that out, I'm there. Um, yes. But, you know, we have some very amazing clients there as well. And some of the clients that we work with used to work in gender-based violence mm. as well. Um, and so, uh, you know, I was, we were having a conversation a while ago and she was, you know, when I was sharing that with her, she's like, oh yeah, you know, she's like, if you are amongst a group of women and you've not been impacted by gender-based violence, you're a minority yes. because that's just, like, and that's sad that that's the reality. Right. Um, but what we do is, is a lot of, um, you know, storytelling, story gathering, and then we use AI on top of that to, the aim is to show how storytelling is actually healing. Mm-hmm. And so we also offer kind of arts-based healing programs as well. And uh, we're just getting started, you know, so, um, we, uh, we're, we're in that sort of story gathering mode and so we're looking for anyone who's comfortable, open, if it's safe to do so, to share nice. any stories around gender-based violence that you've experienced, that you've witnessed, whether you specifically may be observing it in other people mm. or around you um, and, and anyone who wants to kind of share that, you know, we're doing something in person Jan 21st in California, but if we can do everything remotely as well. So we're just looking for stories, anyone who wants to share that story um, I think that storytelling, that story sharing is very important for a few reasons. Um, you know, there's a lot of shame around gender-based violence. Yeah. And when you, that act of storytelling is very empowering for people um, to know that it's not just you, you're not alone. Um, also, it is from that awareness perspective, you know, how can we gain awareness around gender-based violence, what's happening, et cetera. Um, yeah. But yeah, so I, I'm very excited about, about 8 Billion Voices. Um, and, you know, from my own personal experience, it's something that's very important to me. Yeah. But it's also, you know, 
it's not just this, again, more of, it's not just like a cathartic thing for me. It's also, I understand its implications in society. And I think when we talk about my whole history, which we've gone through today, yeah. you know, I think that it makes sense, right? Like it's not just the gender-based violence I experienced, but it's also how you see the, the threads of that in the workplace, mm. in corporate, mm-hmm. in, in all these other aspects, in discrimination and in all these things, you know, I think that it all ties together, right? You can't talk about gender-based violence without talking about like social housing. You can't right. without talking about war, without talking, because it's all the same dynamics. It's all the same dynamics of patriarchy. You know, you can't talk about climate change without talking about refugee displacement. Like mm. all these things connect and it's all because of the same dynamics that we are conditioned to believe is the right way, but it's yeah. been so harmful, you know? Like I said earlier, we were talking about that episode, the climate change episode um, on the human challenge, right? Like we have become so, so into consumerism that we've actually rushed the age of the planet, right? Like that should kind of scare people a little bit that that's how, and what does that tell us about us as human beings, how Mm. we've become so selfish, how we've become so ignorant, how we've forgotten a lot of the core values of humanity. Um, You can cut this out if you want after, but like, we're watching a live stream genocide right now yeah. and we are watching our Western governments prefer to bomb the third poorest country in the world, Yemen, than to call for a ceasefire. Mm. What does that say about us as humanity, <laughs> right? Like that's really sad. It's very sad. If you wanted to quote unquote, stop the Houthis, you should have just called for a ceasefire. <laughs> it's not that complicated, no. but like how upsetting is that? Like how upsetting is that? That's how far gone we are from yeah. humanity that like, we can't even register that, you know, that we've consciously made decisions to do that than to just call for a ceasefire and create space for peace. Yes. And peace is not the same thing as justice, by the way. So maybe it's not just peace. Maybe we should be calling for justice. Right. Right. Like, yeah. So I don't know, but it's just, that is why these things are important. Again, 8 billion Mm -hmm. voices to me is not just this thing of being cathartic. It is, I can see how these threads are connected. Right. And when you can start talking about one, you kind of start talking about the others, right? right? And I think that's why it's important. Yes. You know what I mean? And Drawing so connections. very, yeah. very excited about it. And I'm like, I'm the CEO, but like, I mean, it's not, I don't even think a billion voices would be even possible without our president. Like she has this vision and there are moments, I'm not even sure I understand the vision, but it's okay. Like, I mean <laughs> that in no critical way. I yes. mean that in a way that people, they have their visions. And you know, for me, I'm like, I'm here to help you. Like, let's, bring this vision together but I love the fact that there are times when I'm like I'm sorry I can't see this right now but I will I just you might have to tell me a few more times you might need to show me some more things before I understand what you're saying but it's it's but yeah I mean she is she's amazing and I've learned a lot from her about you know I think going back to what we were talking about earlier about softness yeah I've learned a lot from her about being soft, I think, is the leader, you know, um, mm. especially come out of places like corporate where it's right. not really allowed yeah. or you're feel you're made to feel like it's not allowed. And so I've learned a lot about having to kind of like check that a little bit, mm. like having to be able to be like, OK, Vanessa, like because there are times when I almost get upset at her softness and I'm like, why on earth? Like, that doesn't even make sense. But it's just because it's, that's like literally a conditioned behavior. Right. Yeah. And so there are moments where I'm like, whoa Vanessa like what is that and and, you know then I have to go explore and I'm like oh my goodness and so you know I think that and and I think what's beautiful too about that is that she doesn't intentionally make me reflect on that right it's literally just the act of being around somebody like that that can encourage that in you right does that make sense definitely yeah but I'm very I'm very excited about your billion voices that's amazing so how can we as listeners engage with that and how can we share our stories if that's something that absolutely we want to? um i mean if anyone wants to share their stories i mean you can i think the easiest way right now would be just go onto our website we're gonna fill that out a little bit more we're gonna have more of a distinct process on the website yeah. coming up um but the easiest way actually you can also follow us on instagram and probably just send us a dm and then we can set up something from there um, there could be an option for anybody who wants to, um, you know, send us anything pre-recorded as well, right? And we can just submit it that way. But yeah, yeah probably sending us a DM on Instagram is the best way. Uh, we navigate that pretty, or we we monitor the Instagram Instagram quite well and quite regularly. Um, and then of course we do take into consideration, you know, things like safety. If there are people, obviously there are people in positions who probably want to share, and you know, for safety purposes, can't. If you're in a court case or something, right? A lot of that right. stuff can't be uh, can't be divulged, but we do take those things into consideration, especially when we do the live recordings. If there has to be any voice masking, any you know, 
uh, need face mask, any of that stuff, right? All that right. stuff is, is considered and we will ask you all those questions. Yeah. And so I just offer that, um, you know, just offering a bit more of a trauma-informed lens yeah. as yeah. well. That, that is very important to us as an organization. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, okay, let's move on to wrapping this up, I guess. Um, advice and reflection. Um, <laughs> I guess one piece of advice that you'd give to young adults growing up in the Sioux, mm. or youth growing in the Sioux. Hmm, I think I would say being open-minded and open-hearted I think um you know I think when I was young I don't think I really appreciated Sault Ste. Marie as much as I do right now yeah. um coming back and so I think that you know Sault Ste. Marie is, is very beautiful you know and I say that as someone I've lived in Toronto I've lived in Calgary I've lived in Mexico I've lived in California um you know but there is something about Sault Ste. Marie that is very beautiful. Yeah. And I, I don't, I, I don't know, like, you know, the St. Mary's River, like Bellevue Park, I really don't know if it gets any more beautiful than that. <laughs> and so that would be my, you know, maybe reflection, my offering for young adults growing up Sault Ste. Marie. Stay open-minded, stay open-hearted. Um, the world is so vast. Um, and I think that, I think that Sault Ste. Marie is a core part of the heart of the world because mm -hmm. you know we just sit in such a unique position of being between the Great Lakes. Yeah. Um, I think that I would also encourage everyone to really, really engage in our indigenous communities here locally. I think we have a very unique opportunity for that being in Northern yes. Ontario to really understand our indigenous communities, to really participate, to really um, hold space and be supportive of our indigenous communities. And, you know, we have a few indigenous owned businesses in the community mm -hmm. as well, you know. Um, and I, I really think that doing that at a young age is so important because when we can start seeing the world from that type of a lens, we start understanding society, we start understanding why we live in the world we live in and we see the injustices that exist. Yep. And it takes every single one of us to do just very tiny things. Like I said, just showing up to start advocating for some of that change yep. you know what I mean yeah. um, and so I would definitely encourage young adults to explore that a little bit more don't get confined by the rules of the world especially being in a small town mm -hmm. we are a little bit more mm -hmm. remote and so sometimes those boundaries can impact us a bit more but stay open-minded stay open-hearted and and you know really be because we are so remote so small there is still such a we still can see so much, right? Does that make sense? Like being yeah. so small, being so remote, we can still see so much and still learn so much about the world just within our community. Yeah. And so I encourage everyone, not just young adults, but yeah. everyone to to maybe uh, allow that to sink in and see how it resonates and mm -hmm. then maybe, yeah, fig, you know, figure out if there's a way for you to contribute mm -hmm. in that way. Beautiful. Um, so how can listeners connect with your content, the podcast, how can we Us. find it, your socials, yes, yes. whatever else? Um, I think, I think the, I don't, I have to be honest, social media is not my forte, but the Instagram is <laughs> where I'm the yeah. most active on the Instagram. Um, and then you can find the show on every major, uh, you know, podcast site, Amazon, Spotify, like I mentioned, it was an Amazon Music, an Acast, Indie Podcast Amplifier in 2023, so that was super exciting. Um, so you can find it on any of those, also on YouTube. Uh, my website as well, um, you can visit my website, so you'll find the show there. You'll find a lot of uh, tools I have there for mindfulness. I'm going to start doing a little bit more around mindfulness and even, um, like, um, I don't say athletes, but like exercise, you know, how can you integrate mindfulness into workouts? Yeah. And I do that a lot at Ram. So if anyone is interested, you know, we've got some cool programs coming up at Ram Fitness. So um, there's always that opportunity there as well. And I'm also a certain, my, through my mindfulness, I'm also a mindfulness guide on the Inside Timer app. So if anyone uses Inside Timer, um, there are some free practices there and you can uh, practice with me, practice with me there. Amazing. Yes. So I wanted to start a new last final question with everyone on the podcast yes yes um yes. so say a hundred years from now the sioux museum mm. has an exhibit on you vanessa Plano. uh what would the headliner title of the exhibit be and what three artifacts would be on display oh i love this <laughs> question what a question <laughs> Whew, it's a hard one that is a hard one what would the head i mean 
I would want a headline probably around the power of healing to shape humanity. I mm. think that would be the headline or the title because I think that is the, I think that's a core statement or essence behind being human, right? Yeah. Be human to yourself, to each other, to the world. It starts with you, the power of healing to shape humanity. What three artifacts would be on display? Oh my. Mm. <laughs> Okay, maybe what I would do is I would have a stack of my journals. Mm -hmm. I think that would be one. Ooh, I would put, I, I love tea, and I would um, put my, I, I always get to the celestial tea. It's, I call it tiger tea, but it's the Bengal spice. There'd be a box of that. That would be an artifact. Oh my, I have a great, what else would go on there? <laughs> And this is a Sault Ste. Marie story, so I'm going to share it because it's so good. I was one day walking Bellevue Park with my dog, and this man walked by. I can't remember his name right now. But he's an older fella, and he walked by, and he wanted to say hi to my dog. And I was like, yeah, of course. My dog's an attention seeker, so she <laughs> always welcomes anybody who wants to tell her she's beautiful. And, um, and so we're walking, and this man wants to, you know, says hi to my dog, and we start chatting. And he starts telling me, because he's walking the Bellevue Park Trail, and he says, well, I collect uh, four-leaf clovers. So he goes on the trail, and he finds them, and then he collects them. And then he actually um, laminates them, and he gives them to people. It was so beautiful. I was like, oh, my gosh, that's so beautiful. Like, thank you for doing that. And then he reached into his pocket and pulled out three laminate squares that had four leaf clovers in them and then some other flowers he had picked one that had like forget me nots and he's like here these are my last three you can have them and honestly I was like so touched and that's what I would put on display because I think it was just a beautiful message you know he's like I do that just to bring a smile to people's faces that is so and beautiful. you know and I think that it's it's that it's you know these artifacts these are like moments of humanity to me mm -hmm. and so that's yeah that is why I would put those as one of the artifacts because I think it was just a very beautiful message a very beautiful connection yes. to just like honor and and I actually still have them and you know I'm a very spiritual person so four leaf clovers have a certain significance yep. um and and yeah it was just it was just it was very beautiful and so I think especially because it's Sault Ste. Marie I would definitely make that as an artifact so yes I would say what was my first one? What did I say my first one was? Um, your journals. Right, my stack of journals. That's kind of boring, though. I, can I remove that one? I want to put <laughs> sure. something a little bit more meaningful. I don't like that one. Uh, but certainly, I want I put my, my tea there but beca because I think that that is like a way of me grounding back to myself, right? Yeah. Um, tea is a very important part of my own kind of spiritual practices. Yep. And so that's why I would put tea there because I'd want people to, you know, be like, What's your, what's your artifact for grounding yourself, right? Mm. Um, yeah. And then I would probably even say candles. I really like yeah. candles a lot. I think they're, um, again, part of my spiritual practices. Um, but the representation of candles, you know, the journey of being human, that journey from lightness to dark, um, you know, again, coming back to, like, our indigenous communities, coming back to how we honor both death and life through candles, yeah. and again, part of the human experience, so I think that's what I would do, and then, yeah, I would want that, the four-leaf clovers there, because that is, like, the beauty of Sault Ste. Marie yeah. in one interaction, yeah. right, so that would be my three artifacts. Amazing, <laughs> oh, thank you so much, I learned so much from this conversation, oh. <laughs> I resonated with a lot of it, and it was just, it was beautiful. Yeah. So I appreciate you coming yeah. on and chatting with me. No, of course. No, thank you. I'm, I'm always happy to. And then, yes, please, everyone be welcome to uh, follow me on Instagram, Vanessa Ferlano or yes. VanessaFerlano.com. And you can get a copy of Human here at the museum. I think yes. we only have two copies left. So. Really? Yeah. <laughs> Many <Print> run. Run. <laughs> Amazing. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> Hi, I'm JL Fazell, and I write and publish poetry inspired by nature and the art of being human. These are some of my words. I really love nature because it's so connected. 
to itself, to past, present, future, it's, it's poet gold. So this poem is from my third book, North of Dreams, and it's called Soulful Earth. This land is so much more than you'll ever see with a glance. The things that live around us thrive on the nutrients of things that are made up of bits of the past. That's why you can find faces hidden in the bark of trees 